Welcome everyone to our fourth colloquium in our series on philosophy and the mental health act. This is the fourth talk uh, in the series of events exploring philosophical aspects of the mental health act and psychiatry in general. Now, before I introduce the speakers today, I just want to thank the Salby Foundation for supporting this event, uh, the rest of the series and our project. For more information about our events and projects, uh, please see the links that will now be posted uh, in this chat. Um, so also in terms of what's going to happen today, uh, we'll first hear from our speaker for 45 minutes, then we'll have a very quick break, and then we'll have a Q&A uh, for the remaining 45 minutes. And we are having both a in-person and a virtual audience uh, today. Everyone's very welcome. I just want to uh, emphasize that um, we we'll always make sure that the people joining online can ask questions as well, which I'll explain later. So having said that, uh, I'm now delighted uh, to be able to introduce Professor Rachel Cooper, who is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Lancaster. She's written on various topics in the philosophy of psychiatry and psychiatric classifications, including the DSM, and today will be talking to us about disorder, deviance, descent, and the limits of medical science. So Rachel, we're going to you. Is that my face? That is my face mask. Is that my face? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> my mom's face mask on the other day. That was really bad. Hello. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, people here and and people of mine as well. Um, so the paper I've got today is uh, part of a larger project. Um, so it's a project I've been working on for a very long time, but will hopefully one day finish. So um, the project I'm working on is I'm trying to understand our current concept of disorder. And when I'm talking about disorder, I mean kind of injuries, wounds, any kind of pathological condition all considered together. So I'm interested in uh, what the distinction is between the normal and the pathological. And um, my project is relatively modest. So uh, I'm trying to analyze and understand how our current concept works. Uh, in contrast to uh, people who are engaged in revisionary projects and thinking about what might be best for the future. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing in general. Um, just to give people a, a brief kind of, a very brief two sentence outline of the way these debates go. So on the one hand, there are some people who think that whether or not something is a disorder at the end of the day has to do with biological or psychological facts. So Christopher Bors would be the big name. He thinks that if there's a biological dysfunction, then there's a disorder, and that's like the end of the matter. And I think he's wrong. So I am putting together um, an account of disorder where it's going to end up depending on various complicated kind of political and ethical judgments whether something's a disorder or not. Now, so that's what I'm, I'm doing kind of in general. I'm not talking about um, uh, every, like the whole project today. What I'm talking about today is focusing on a bit of it. Um, so I'm interested in how we might think about the distinction between behaviour that's indicative of disorder and behaviour that occurs because people are choosing to do odd, troubling or immoral things. Um, so I've got some pictures to illustrate some of the cases that might seem kind of puzzling in this sort of domain. So the question is, how do we distinguish between behaviour that's indicative of disorder and behaviour that's uh, people doing things on purpose, uh, but that is just kind of unusual or, or, or weird or eccentric, whatever. So you can think about cases where uh, some people to list, seem to lose their temper very easily, and you might wonder what's going on there. Something like hoarding disorder. Hoarding disorder, I think, is particularly interesting. Um, so hoarding disorder has only been recognised as a disorder comparatively recently. And one of the things that's fairly uh, often the case is that many people who hoard stuff want to hoard stuff. So people might fill their houses with loads of books and they might say like, yeah, I, I know that I can't use my dining room, but I don't care. I really like having books and, you know, I can't bother classifying them. Um, I'm quite happy like this. Um, uh, so that's, that's an example of a case where individuals often say that they're, they're quite happy doing what they're doing and they might be, be able to give some reasons for what they're doing. 
um, and and yet it's it, it's a, a an issue that's somehow kind of kind of troubling. Um, we can think of uh, political dissidents. So um, particularly in the Soviet Union now, Russia and also in China, there's a tradition which has had it that various types of political dissident have quite often been considered to suffer from uh, mental disorder. So you can think of someone like uh, Navalny. So Navalny, as you know, uh, he had poison put in his underpants. He made it to a safe country. And so what did he do? Well, so obviously what you do is you take the mickey out of Putin and fly straight back. Right? Um, and uh, th th there was a spokesperson for, from the Kremlin saying that uh, he, he, he was mentally disordered and fixated with his crotch area. You know, it, 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 it's like this kind of quote about how there's some kind of Freudian problems going on there. Or so uh, we've got these various kinds of cases. Now I take it that it's part of our concept of disorder that behaviour that is indicative of disorder is in some sense not on purpose. Um, so there's behaviours that where people are uh, doing it on purpose, which aren't going to. So uh, sometimes it will be suggested that really nobody has free will at all. And then there isn't really going to be any distinction between things that are done on purpose and things that are uh, caused by disorders. Now, I'm uh, not going to have time to go into this in any detail, but I'm just going to assume that most of us, most of the time, are responsible for what we're doing and are acting intentionally. Um, so I'm going to follow the line taken by Peter Strawson in his famous paper, Freedom and Resentment. So Strawson, uh, basically points out that if you think of the ways in which we interact with other people, we're tacitly firmly committed to the thought that people are responsible for what they're doing. So we go through our lives blaming people um, and praising people and hating people uh, and respecting people. And it's important to us that other people treat us with those kinds of attitudes as well. And that only makes sense, Strawson argues, if we're presupposing uh, tacitly that for the most part people are responsible for what they're doing. Um, so I'm going to take that for granted. So, but then the question is, well, okay, so let's suppose that much of the time, um, many of us are responsible for what we're doing. Still, it looks like there's some cases where people uh, clearly, clearly aren't. So you can uh, think of cases where somebody hits you, but they're having an epileptic fit, for example. Uh, you're not going to count that as, as being a, a free action. So there is, there's, there's clearly some cases where behaviour is indicative of disorder rather than being behaviour that's done on purpose. But the question is, well, how are we going to get to grips with that distinction? Um, I'm just going to start by pointing out some of the difficulties. So if you look at the philosophical literature, on free will, action, and disorder, it seems to me that there's kind of one big circularity. So that if you go and look at the literature on free will, then you'll quickly come uh, across compatibilist positions. Compatibilists are people who think that determinism and free will are compatible. Um, the way their accounts typically work is that they say that people are acting freely unless something funny has gone on with the way in which their actions being caused. So a compatibilist will say that we're acting freely unless we're being coerced or unless we've been hypnotized or unless uh, where our action is, is the consequence of some kind of disorder. So I mentioned Strawson's paper earlier. He's a, a typical figure in this kind of area. Um, so he says that we should adopt what he calls the objective attitude. So that's when we're looking at people, but assuming that they're not acting freely in various cases. And one of the cases when we're going to adopt the objective attitude is when we see someone as warped or deranged or compulsive in behavior. So basically when we think that they're, they're suffering from some kind of mental disorder that's making them act in a particular way. Okay, so in the literature um, compatibilism, you've got this idea, the action that stems from disorder is one amongst the possible types of case that can mean that someone's not acting freely. Um, but they don't tell you kind of what they mean by disorder. But then if you go and look at the literature in the philosophy of medicine, 
where people go on and on uh, about what it is for something to be a disorder, they often tacitly assume that we've got a good understanding of when people are acting freely or not. So for example, uh, a, a fairly popular kind of account in the philosophy of medicine on disorder will say that disorder involves some kind of dysfunction. But typically when they mention it, and quite often people don't, people will say that there's not a dysfunction if you're just choosing not to act in a particular way. So if it's if I'm not digesting my food properly um, and it's because there's something wrong with my uh, they say that uh, a reason consists of some belief type states and some desire type states uh, and that would be taught to do with responsibility um, the idea that people act for motives that they might try their best that that kind of that kind of language but if you go and look in medical journals, then you don't find talk about trying to one, one's best or you know being motivated or responsible or that kind of thing. Depending what kinds of literature you look at, you might find talk of compulsions or personality traits or disinhibition or impulsivity. Or if you look at other kinds of places, you might find talk about genes and brains, uh, but but it doesn't mesh up very well. So um, that's just to kind of say by way of background that things uh, look pretty tricky. Um, now what I'm going to do in the remainder of the paper is first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about a case where people are addicted to drugs um, as an example to illustrate some of the difficulties. Then I'm going to talk a bit about the possibility that there might be certain cases where people behave in a particular way or don't behave in a particular way uh, because the disorders disrupted their capacities to act. And then I'm going to talk about the possibility that there might be disorders that might um, mess up people's abilities to act as free agents because they distort beliefs or desires. And the overall idea of the paper is that um, Facts of medical science are going to be inadequate to determine whether behaviour should be thought of as being indicative of disorder or as being a result of intentional action. Okay, so first of all, thinking uh, about an initial example to illustrate some of the problems. So I've said that I think these issues are very complicated. And if you look at the philosophical literature, you end up with these, these kind of circularity network of claims and people talking in incremental ways and so on. If you look on the kind of websites that medical authorities produce, quite often you'll find statements where people seem to be pretty sure of what's going on. So this is an example from the website of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So that's a, a United States body. And they're talking about Okay, okay, yeah. So the kind of evidence they refer to, some of it is evidence that there are uh, differences in, in the brains of people who take lots of addictive drugs and other people. And then sometimes uh, there'll be talk of there being brain malfunction or, or brain dysfunction. Now, oops. oh, it's me. If I start working now, we can see if you're doing. Yes, I'm worried that I've messed up the recording. No, you haven't. I don't, it's fine. It's someone on live. So Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so when, when it comes to evidence uh, that there's differences in people's brains, um, so this evidence kind of gets cited quite, quite often, uh, but I think that on reflection, uh, people will, will generally accept that uh, evidence of brain differences isn't going to be enough to tell you where the behaviour is being freely chosen or if it's indicative of disorder. So um, the issue is, 
is that there's all kinds of subpopulations where it turns out that their brains are, are different from other people. So there's a famous study um, looking at the brains of London taxi drivers, where there's time differences in London taxi drivers compared to other people. But I mean, like they're freely choosing to learn to be taxi drivers and to drive around. Um, so uh, brain differences get mentioned quite a lot, but I don't think that they're, they're going to help very much. When it comes to the idea that there might, in certain cases, be a brain dysfunction, I take it when people talk about brain malfunction, it's the same sort of idea. Um, as many of you will be aware, in the philosophy of medicine and philosophy of biology, uh, there are big debates about how we ought to understand normal function. There's lots of different accounts. Um, on at least certain accounts, it's going to be a bit difficult to say whether there's a dysfunction in the case where people get addicted to highly addictive drugs or not. So one uh, dominant line of account has it that we should understand biological functions in terms of what our various mental mechanisms or bits of our body have been naturally selected to do. And I mean, people haven't evolved to be able to deal with drugs like heroin. So it's, it's not clear that there's any dysfunction that occurs when things go wrong there. Um, yeah, you might look at it as being a kind of environment organism mismatch case. So it's going to be tricky to say whether there is a dysfunction or not. I'm going to leave that to one side and say, well, let's accept that there is some kind of dysfunction. So for example, uh, people will talk about there being a dysfunction to the reward recognition system or something like that. Whatever it is, let's, let's just say, okay, so maybe, maybe there is some kind of brain dysfunction. Still, things aren't all that clear cut because going the other way, there's some evidence that suggests that at least some people who take lots of addictive drugs maintain some control over their actions. So, uh, these are some examples taken from a paper by Hannah Pickard, where she reviews um, various uh, pieces of evidence that suggest that at least some people, in at least some circumstances, maintain some kind of control. So uh, she reviews um, studies that look at long-term outcomes, and there's lots of people who take addictive drugs who eventually stop. Uh, you know, without receiving treatment, people decide to quit and, and succeed in quitting. She talks also about the successes of contingency management therapy, which is basically a structured programs where you pay people um, to, to not take drugs for certain amounts of time, and those can have some, some successes as well. So things don't look to be all that clear cut. Now, one thing that I think is going to end up being important, and I'm going to end up coming back to, is that... And uh, this evidence that people are maintaining some control over what they're doing is kind of person level evidence. So this isn't looking at what people's brains are like. This is looking at how people act. Um, and one of the things I'm going to end up suggesting is that when we're thinking about whether people are responsible or not, whether they're acting as they want to act, then person level evidence is always going to trump whatever evidence there is about what's going on. Uh, so um, that was just to kind of get us going uh, and to point out that although quite often uh, you, you'll find claims that you know everybody knows that this is a disorder, uh, that, that things can, can be uh, quite tricky. Uh, evidence from brain differences, I think, isn't going to show very much at all. Uh, claims that there's a dysfunction can be quite often be quite tricky to, to figure out whether there really is dysfunction or not. And there's a case here where even if there is some kind of dysfunction, you've got behavioural level evidence that suggests that some people are maintaining some kind of control. But all that being said, I do think it's highly plausible that there are cases where disorders mess up people's ability to act as they want to act. So I'm not sceptical of the idea that there are cases where disorders um, mean that we can't act freely. I'm just arguing that it's going to be difficult to, to pick apart uh, those particular cases. I want to consider now the thought that there are certain cases where disorders destroy our ability to act freely 
because they're disrupting some of the capacities we require to act in, in, in particular ways. Um, so it might be that a disorder uh, means that you've got a broken leg, and so then you can't you can't walk. Um, it, it might be that a disorder uh, destroys your capacities for self-control, um, or uh, those kinds of cases. Now, in these kinds of case, I want to suggest that claims that are based purely on medical science, so claims that look at the biology and psychology of the individual, aren't going to trump lay claims about the capacities of agents. And the reason why I think this goes back to uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier, which is that the language that we use when we're talking about responsibility and intentional action and free will isn't, doesn't quite mesh with the language that gets used in, in medical science. So when we're considering questions to do with responsibility, we judge people as agents. Whereas if we're looking purely at what can be established by medical science, then those are going to be claims to do with uh, people considered as biological, psychological organisms. And I think there are lots of cases where the powers of a person, when you're considering them as an agent, can be greater than the powers that they have if you're focusing on them as a, a biological kind of psychological organism. So I've got for you, first of all, a simple kind of example. Um, so this is um, a, a woman with suppose she can't walk. Um, and so if you were to look at her as a naked human, uh, then you know it's a biological fact that she can't walk, but you know she's using her wheelchair to, to enable her to take a dog for a walk. So uh, if you're looking at what she can do from the perspective that's relevant when you're considering what action she's capable of, they're greater than the capacities that she has if you consider her as a, a naked person, you know, under, under a microscope or, or whatever it might be. Now, People who use wheelchairs are somewhat atypical, but I think that there are lots of cases where all of us, all the time, depend on external scaffolding, which might be material or social, to enable us to act in the ways that we want to act. So to take an example that I think works for all of us, I think that we commonly augment our agency using external resources when it comes to remembering things. So the lab-based studies that show that humans are really rubbish at remembering things. So I, I don't know, you know, like you, you can have studies that show that you can only remember five or seven random numbers or, or whatever it might be. But despite this, we all routinely expect people to remember things that they've been shown in laboratories to be kind of incapable of remembering. And that's because we expect people to write things down. So we blame people if they don't return their library books, you know, six months after when they took them out, or if they forget our birthdays or whatever it might be, because we expect people to write stuff down and to remember things that way. And I think one of the implications of these kinds of practice is that if you have someone who has a brain-based memory, which is worse than other people's, that might not make any difference when it comes to thinking about what we expect them to be able to do. So suppose that most people can remember seven random digits and you can only remember four. It's like, it's not gonna act as an excuse when you don't turn in your library books on time. We take another example. I think we also use external scaffolding to make sure we fulfill our commitments and promises. So I guess you can think of the way that life insurance works. So life insurance means that you can fulfill your financial commitments even if you die. Um, uh, and so that's an example where we can extend our, our moral agency <coughs> into the future even, you know, even when, we're, when we're dead. And I think it's plausible that when it comes to uh, controlling ourselves, we often make use of external resources too. So I mentioned earlier some of these uh, long longitudinal studies that show that uh, many people who use lots of addictive drugs at some point give up. And when people are asked how they do that, they describe a variety of strategies that I think are quite familiar to us. So people will decide that they've had enough and they will move area. 
they would stop hanging out with the people they were hanging out with. They would develop new hobbies, uh, that kind of thing. And so similar strategies used by most people when they're trying to exercise self-control. And it seems plausible that normal willpower or normal self-control depends on these kinds of strategies. Okay, so I think that humans often may use external resources to enable us to act as we want to act. And partly we do that because we can, in comparison to other creatures, because we use tools and we're social creatures. Uh, so we're able to make use of external resources in ways that many animals can't. And also, there are lots of actions that we want to do that are really hard for us. So if you want to write a book, uh, that's really hard. <laughs> if you want to fly, that's really hard. You know? So it's like you need to make use of external tools to do those kinds of things. But I think also that things like acting morally, um, acting in line with your long-term intentions, maintaining a sense of personal identity over time, exercising self-control, those I think are also very hard. Um, and also uh, types of activity where we depend a lot on external resources. And in all cases where people use external resources to perform actions, then medical science, by which I mean the kind of thing you can see if you look at a naked human and you're investigating kind of biological functions, psychological functions, that's going to underestimate their abilities. So, um, I want to come back to think about how I think we should understand claims to medical expertise. So you remember I showed you the quote from, I can't remember what they're called, the US group on uh, of substance use disorder, uh, where they kind of say, look, we know what's going on. Here. I want to suggest that we should distinguish between what I want to call trumping expertise and perspective expertise. So I think there are certain claims to expertise where what an expert says trumps what anyone else might say. So you can think, for example, uh, of a chemist who might say, look, that's, that's not a real diamond. And that's the end of the matter. But I think you can also have perspective expertise. So if you think about taking a sculpture to a scrap dealer, they might say, like, that's worth 50 quid. Um, and that's true uh, from a certain perspective. But at the same time, the sculpture might be worth millions of pounds if you're asking uh, an art, art dealer. And I want to suggest that when it comes to assessing what someone's capable of, of considered as an agent, that medical science is just going to give you a perspective level expertise because people can commonly <coughs> make use of external resources that can augment their capacities, and that's not going to be visible uh, to like a purely medical gaze, by which I mean kind of biological and psychological science. Okay, so having said all that, I do think there are cases where disorders can mess up our capacities to act in particular ways and can mean that someone shouldn't be considered responsible for, for things going wrong. Um, now, how to understand that? Well, so I haven't got a fully worked out account, but my rough thought is that Things can go wrong with your body or mind that can mean that you're, cut, you're unable to act in the ways that you want to act in the same sort of way that things can go wrong with various tools and mean that you can't act as you want to act. So suppose I've promised to pick up your kids from school and then my car breaks down, I've got an excuse. I think I've got the same kind of excuse if I get, have a bang to the head and I forget. Um, so I, I do think that, uh, that things can go wrong <laughs> And, and can can excuse us, uh, but what's going on there is is the same on the same sort of thing. Okay, so that's thinking about the kind of case where uh, somebody suffers a kind of capacity failure, uh, and and that means that they can't act as they wanted to act. There's also another type of case where we might think that someone's not acting freely because the way they behave is indicative of a disorder. So it's plausible that there may also be cases where a disorder disrupts someone's beliefs or desires. And so in those sorts of cases, people do what they want to do, 
but what they want has been messed up uh, by the disorder because the disorder in some way has disrupted their beliefs and desires. And I think it's highly plausible that there are such cases, but figuring out exactly which cases they are is again, um, I'm going to argue, going to be very difficult and not something which we can just do by considering trans-scientific facts. So, how might we spot distorted beliefs and desires? Now, one thing to say at the outset is that I think that there may be cases where disorders disrupt our beliefs and desires, but there might be other things that also might mess up our beliefs and desires. So you can think of cases maybe where someone hypnotizes you uh, as, as also uh, distorting your beliefs and desires, or cases where people have just lied to you a lot. So I, I think that there might be a range of ways in which our beliefs and desires might get distorted, um, and they're not all going to count as disorders. But uh, I I'm asking, like, how can we spot cases where beliefs and desires have been messed up by something or other with the thought that a subset of those are going to be disorders? And roughly, there's two ways you can set about um, trying to do this. You might try to pick out certain beliefs and desires as being wrong as judged by some kind of external standards. So you might say that there are certain beliefs and desires that are in some way irrational, or the most obvious way to go uh, would be to try and appeal to some kind of evolutionary standards. Or well, the other way you might go is you might try to pick out beliefs and desires that have become distorted by using some kind of agent relative standard. So the distorted beliefs and desires would be those that fail to fit in some way. So maybe they don't mesh properly with second order beliefs or desires, maybe they're uncontrollable, maybe uh, they fail to fit uh, across time and don't seem to fit in with what a person is normally like. So I'm going to go through these in turn and try and convince you that both are quite tricky to get to work. So what happens if we try and tell a kind of evolutionary story about beliefs and desires? So roughly the thought would be that we've evolved to have truish beliefs and adaptive desires. So you'd expect people to have evolved to kind of believe the evidence of their senses. And then you could think of cases where people suffer delusions and uh, believe things where there's, there's no evidential support for them whatsoever or go completely against what you can see. Those look like cases where something's gone wrong. You might suppose that you could expect people to have evolved to want to eat nutritious food and if someone wants to eat feces instead, you might say, look, it looks like something's gone wrong, gone wrong there. So I think those kind of stories have an initial plausibility, but I'm going to argue that there's cases where they're inadequate um, and where value judgment is <coughs> required. So the first kind of case I want to discuss is uh, a case explored by George Graham in his book, The Abraham Dilemma, which is a really interesting book. So Graham is interested in the question of how we might distinguish between religious delusions and eccentric religious beliefs. And this turns out to be quite important because amongst delusions, religious delusions are fairly common, but it also turns out that loads of people have slightly wacky kind of religious or spiritual beliefs. And uh, this isn't something where you can just appeal to you know, people believing the evidence of their senses, because it's a domain where loads of people believe things that are, are not directly going to be refuted by uh, sensory evidence. And what Graham ends up arguing is that at the end of the day, delusions of the beliefs that uh, are, are stuck and that cause you big problems. So roughly, if you believe, as Abraham did, that God wants you to sacrifice your son and you're up for doing that, then that counts as a delusion. Whereas if you have a belief that God wants you to say a little prayer for the world every morning and put daisies on people's doorsteps, then that's, then that's fine. Um, and value judgments are going to play a role in that, drawing that kind of distinction. We can take another case. So um, I mentioned earlier this this long tradition which is thought that various types of political dissident might uh, suffer from mental disorder. 
Now, this is a quote taken from a Chinese text on forensic psychiatry. Um, it's a comparatively recent text. And so this text is considering how psychiatrists might pick out political protesters who uh, should be thought of as having a disorder as compared to uh, standard political protesters. And here you've got this suggestion that Certain protest is indicative of mental disorder because uh, the person would often display absolutely no sense or instincts of self-preservation, for example, by openly mailing out reactionary letters or pasting up reactionary slogan banners in public places and even in some cases signing his or her real name to the documents. Uh, and Monroe suggests that that kind of makes a certain amount of sense. So there you've got the thought. So I, I think quite often in in discussions in the philosophy of psychiatry, that many people have thought that psychiatrists in China and uh, the Soviet Union are kind of cynical when they're diagnosing political dissidents as having mental disorder. Munro suggests that there's a perspective from which it kind of makes sense. So roughly the thought is, is that you've got to be mad to sign your name to a letter that's criticizing the government in China. Um, and certainly if you have an evolutionary story about the kinds of beliefs and desires people ought to have, that, that makes a certain amount of sense. You know, it's, it, it looks like it's a really bad idea to go around protesting in situations where you're bound to lose. But that's probably not a line that we want to take. So um, I think that uh, appealing to some kind of objective standard, which might well, most the most obvious way to go would be to have some kind of evolutionary story quite quickly kind of runs out the screen. So what about the other possibility that we instead uh, look to have some kind of agent relative standard that might enable us to pick out certain mental states as having potentially been distorted um, you know, maybe by a disorder. So you could tell a variety of stories here. Um, it might be that there's certain mental states that don't match up with second order. Uh, uh, beliefs and desires, there might be some that are uncontrollable, there might be some that are just continuous with the only self. So the basic problem is that if you go for any kind of moderate account, it's going to capture too many, too many people, because I guess most of us have kind of messy mental lives and suffer from uh, incongruous desires and you know, temptations and weakness of will and inconsistencies in our beliefs and desperate. But you might say, well, what happens if we think about really radical cases? So um, this is Phineas Gage. I'm sure you've seen him before. So Phineas Gage, he, he's holding a metal pole. The metal pole went through his brain. And uh, this injury changed his personality uh, in, in a fairly all-encompassing kind of way. So you can imagine cases where it looks like there's been really, really significant changes in someone's mental states. But the problem is, I think, is that even in these very radical cases, we can't be too certain what's going on because there are also cases of normative transformation and change. So people can, people's mental states can radically change when they have a metal pole through their brain, but they can also radically shift as a result of falling in love or a mystical experience or uh, joining some political party or something like that. And so you might say, well, how might we distinguish between normative transformation and change and pathological transformation and change? And it's tempting to kind of say, well, you know, there's different kinds of causes. So roughly, if your beliefs change because a metal pole goes through your head, that's bad. Uh, but if you fall in love, then that's, that's OK. If you experience God, that's, that's kind of OK. But my worry now is that I think we've got a kind of circularity going on, on here. So um, I think we're only able to kind of pick out something like heroin as being an illegitimate desire disorder because we already think of it as being a disorder producing substance. And that comes out, I think, clearly if you think about uh, disputes about the effects of psychedelic drugs. So this is a book written by a colleague of mine um, and he swears he doesn't take loads of drugs. But the, the basic um, point of this book is uh, that uh, so this is by Chris Partridge called High Culture. He's arguing that there are various drugs that can be considered as technologies of transcendence. So he's thinking particularly of drugs like LSD. And the book is kind of a, 
uh, it's a, 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 a kind of historical um, account of various cultures where people have taken loads of drugs and have interpreted the changes in uh, beneficial ways. For people who like Foucault, Foucault uh, says that having LSD was the greatest experience of his life and there's the idea that that's influenced his philosophical writing. Um, now, um, I think what this case brings out quite clearly is that what you make of these kinds of changes in people's mental states depends on, on your evaluation of the changes. So if you think that these changes are on balance good, <laughs> then, uh, then you're going to think that you know, it's normative transformation of change. If you think that they're bad, then you're going to say that this is a pathological change. So where have we got to? Well, so um, I think it is part of our concept of disorder that behaviour is only going to be indicative of disorder if it's not voluntary. Um, and that's going to be, I think, a necessary but not sufficient condition for behaviour to be indicative of disorder. So I think there are other things that can cause you to um, act uh, unfreely as well as disorders, but disorders are going to be indicative of disorder. But I've argued that biomedical facts are going to be of limited use in determining whether action is voluntary. When it comes to working out what actions are possible for someone, biopsychic facts aren't going to trump common sense judgments. I think that's because many of our actions are enabled by environmental scaffolding, which means that we can have capacities that aren't going to be visible to uh, a purely biological from psychological gaze. And in particular, amongst the actions that I think we make use of external scaffolding for will be uh, exercise and self-control, for example. And then when it comes to the idea that disorders might distort beliefs and desires, I think it's highly plausible that there are cases where that happens. But again, picky, when it comes to picking them out, um, scientific facts aren't going to enable us to get very far. And that's it. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm just sprinting to the camera here. Uh, thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Shall I be polite? It's a bit, it's really strange setup. Okay, so uh, as for a form, I think we take a kind of a three minute break for people to go to the loo, grab a glass of water, or whatever, and then we have uh, a QA. So we will be back in. Roughly three minutes, I can't see clock, but I'm sure we can work out. So the way this is going to work, if you want to ask a question and you're in the audience, you are welcome. Probably the easiest thing, rather than raising your hand, is just to put a cue in the chat, and then I will call on you. Uh, or to type out your questions in the chat, and then I'll ask, uh, I'll can read out your questions. So just so I can still continue to orient myself on the chat, are there any questions from the room? Yeah, there is. We'll take a question from the room first so I can see what's going on in the chat. Go yeah. for it. Well, uh, yeah, thank you for the talk, Rachel. Um, I found it really interesting. I've been working on the borderline personality disorder. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of these issues that's been discussed in relation to borderline as well. Um, but what I really noticed is just kind of, I really like the idea of emphasizing external factors in like free will debates and also I think it's something that's lacking the philosophical debates about free will. Um, and I was wondering, so when we talk about addiction, right, or I think it tends to, well, in some states it's sort of all encompassing in your life, but in most states it's related to a specific domain, so they go to specific substances or all sorts of things, right? And I'm thinking of it as kind of like, usually we talk about either you're cognitive or not, but rather it's a kind of graded thing, right? So there are different domains and aspects where you might say, oh, I know myself around other things if I start in that, right? Um, and yeah, but I think it's, and, but I also think that's need to add to the kind of degrees is that normally we do think, or at least as far as I'm aware, like in public, they we tend to judge people differently depending on what kind of um, let's say ground conditions they had in terms of doing well, some academically, they tend to think that 
someone who doesn't have his first generation, maybe does not have a long line of professors in the family, is doing well in becoming a professor or getting into grades with the gesture of different. Yeah, those just some thoughts. Um, but I think there's also obviously the project is not like disorder, but there's also some implications for the free will literature at large, but that's maybe another project. Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, if you take the second part of the question, so, right, so it's a comment really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so, yeah. so I guess I guess you're pointing out that uh, to a large extent we do kind of already accept that life's easier for some people than others, yeah. you know, depending on what kind of external resources they have at their disposal. Um, and I, on the one hand, I think that's true, but I think that um, quite often we don't go far enough with that kind of thinking. So I, I think there is um, plausibly a tendency uh, for people uh, to think of self-control and willpower as being more to do with internal resources than maybe they, they actually are. Um, and uh, so people can be a bit cocky when they're going well and kind of think that, you know, it's due to them and quite harsh on other people. Um, uh, so, so I take your point, but I guess I'm, I'm tempted to think to go further uh, with, with that kind of way of thinking about things. Um, the other I forgot what the other bit was. Yeah, the other bit was just kind of like, so you were, yeah, by emphasizing the external elements, there's yeah. also something of like social factors matters, but also like domain. Yes, yes, you're, you're definitely right, yeah. Different. So I guess my, my thought is, is that all humans uh, are pretty rubbish at um, acting well um, and doing what they want to do. Um, uh, so I think it's something that people in general struggle with. I think when we succeed, uh, we often have to make use of social scaffolding, material scaffolding, um, and quite often we succeed because we're kind of lucky in various ways. Uh, and um, so because I'm tempted to think that when we act well, we're making new use of loads of little bits and pieces of external support, then when and how you succeed is going to be very domain specific. So I'm going to read out a question from the chat. Uh, this is, I probably mispronounced this, Svana Stemler, who asks, if all of us have these kinds of experiences and have the same characteristics as disorders, what purpose might the term disorder serve? Is it even a useful term anymore, or wouldn't it be easier to just throw it out? This is the question of degree. Thanks for interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think it is a, a, a question of degree. So um, I so I guess roughly my thought is, is that there's a range of cases where there's long ongoing debate. So things like um, various types of addiction, personality disorders, um, cases where people lose their temper, uh, things like, like hoarding, where uh, you know, there's long standing debate and uncertainty about exactly what's going on there. I guess what I want to say is that I think those cases really are problematic. <laughs> Uh, and and but in many cases, kind of no one's actually going to be all that all that sure what's going on there. But that being said, I think that there are some cases where it's it's pretty clear that uh, a disorder has messed up someone's capacity to to act. Um, so I mean, you can take take the case where people lash out you know, because they're having a fit or something like that, um, where where it, 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 it's it's pretty clear that they're they're not in control of what's going on there. And I, although I think it's hard to pick out exactly which cases are which, I do think it's plausible that disorders can mess up our beliefs and desires um, as well. And so various cases of delusion um, would be examples of that as well. So it's not that I'm sceptical of the idea that disorders can uh, um, incapacitate us as free agents. It's just that I think that it can be... be hard to figure out exactly which cases fall under that sort of heading and to, it's going to be a judgment call that depends on various kind of value judgments being made as well as on 
purely matters of uh, biological or psychological effect. Uh, there is a question from the room. There's a question, a cue from Paul Fletcher. Paul, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, hello there. Can everybody hear me okay? Marvellous. Um, what I'd like to ask a question about is about perception uh, regarding psychosis. Um, and there was a study done in Cardiff where um, people suffering from mild psychosis were, were shown a picture, a black and white, like block, blotchy picture, like a negative, and then they were found the actual image. Uh, now, when this test was repeated with people without mental health difficulties or psychosis, they had problems identifying the image, but the people who had mild psychosis could identify what the image was from the negative, the black and white thing, black and white picture, more accurately. So I wonder if, if it's not in effect like a broken brain, but a, people with psychosis or mental health problems are trying to perceive the world with too much information coming into their thought patterns and in some cases they, they can actually make sense of things that normal people cannot I wondered if you had any thoughts on that at all yeah no I think that sounds very plausible so I have been talking in terms of uh, uh, disorders um, potentially uh, kind of reducing someone's capacities I think I think you're right and it might be more useful to say something like look there's various types of um, biologically or psychologically based difference that change someone's capacities. Um, and uh, in, in, certain, in certain cases, something you, you might have a condition where people are, um, have more capacities than, than other folks in particular domains. So um, uh, like studies on depressive realism would be another example. Um, uh, so, so, so I guess it would be more that um, various conditions can affect the, the the capacities that we we have available to us. Lisa Birmingham, Lisa was not in Birmingham. Does this project and things like depressive realism, right? And whether these mission kind of can help us to understand that. So I wonder if she knows about that. This is the first time I've heard about this study about psychosis and the brain differences. Um, there's a question from Dr. P. Madani. In forensic psychiatry, there's often a question raised on the influence of mental disorders or free will slash exercise and self-control. This is relatively easier to answer when it comes to psychosis, but not so much when it comes to neurotic disorders. One view is that any disorder affects agency. Is there a view of this? Um, I think it's I think it's almost certainly going to be the case that there are certain types of disorder that damage agency more than others. And I think it's not just going to be due to, I, I think it's not just going to have to do with, as it were, like the intrinsic severity of the disorder. So I think that uh, our abilities to act as we want to act do typically depend on external resources a lot. Um, and so one of the things that I think is that there are cases where people may have lived with a condition for a long time and where they may have more resources at their disposal such that, um, uh, you know, if, 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 suppose you have bipolar disorder and that happens to you frequently, then you can, um, then you can kind of plan ahead potentially um, and uh, uh, to, to make sure that some of your projects can still continue. So like you can set up direct de debits for things that you definitely want to pay out or, 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 or that kind of thing. And so um, I think, the, the extent to which a condition affects someone that's agency is going to depend on a range of factors, partly to do with like the intrinsic nature of the disorder, partly also to do with that person's setting. So, you know, it's like some people are richer than, than others and have, have more kind of external tools at their disposal or more friends or, or, or that kind of thing can make a difference. And then also um, it makes a difference whether you've lived with something for a long time 
so that you've been able to adapt to and, and kind of get used to living with it or whether it's kind of come on so suddenly. Uh, yeah, does that answer the, the question enough? We don't know. There's a comment which I think is related to the issue of the psychosis, which says it's interesting to link with trauma responses into behavior that stems from protecting the organism, but then also maybe diagnosis and disorders. So I guess it's another example where behavior is kind of some pictures in some ways, but not in others. That just seems a comment. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah this. So I was thinking of trauma as well, but differently in terms of like whether trauma is like say prior history, right? Which is maybe we would also say is an external factor. It's also relevant to this of like if there's like it doesn't have to be right now the conditions, it could also be prior. But that there's like some interesting things in like thinking about etiology and how trauma is thought of as like being what develops the death disorder in the first place. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, where trauma fits into this kind of thinking of it as like externalized and self control. I mean, um, so I, I think it, so I, I think um, trauma is, it, it, is going to have a range of different effects on different people. So um, uh, in, in the, it, it, it affects how people kind of interact with their environment, which uh, is going to affect how it's possible for them to make use of that environment in, in the future. Um, uh, so it, it's going to have a range of different kinds of effects. Is that? Yeah, but yeah. it's just interesting because yeah. trauma frequently is also like part of the environment which is why there's a kind of dual thing going on you know, like continuous thing. Yeah, that's a future question. Can I ask, so the, the person you just answered, uh, P. Madani, about the agency question, says that's absolutely brilliant. Please go kind of use it when it's all bought. I'm glad, I'm glad. Can I ask a question? So, um, in your uh, talk, right, you make, I mean, what I think is very plausible claim that right out of investigating the naked body, out of kind of investigating uh, machine concepts of belief, etc., you can't come at extinction uh, between kind of disorder versus potentially occurring action without certain kind of value judgments, right? But so my kind of I mean, if, if we put this against the, the context, right, of this larger metric as well, just like data based medicine. I mean, isn't a way that somebody who nonetheless wants to hold on to a kind of naturalist team, right? Or as you put it, you don't say anything about actually talk about medical science, right? Who nonetheless wants to hold on for like a meaty role of medical science here in a way that is at least somewhat prized loose from a kind of it's just a value or it's just a kind of thing, will say, well. You know, isn't this what goes on to be quite a lot of bootstrapping? So sure, you know, in like a thing in this gauge case, which you could compare with the gauge, right? Well, somebody actually gave this example in the chat and I had the exact same thought, right? Having a baby, like massively transformative, it changes your brain, changes your, 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 you know, kind of core features of what you think, changes your desires completely, right? Um, or, you know, losing a loved one or kind of all these kind of examples. That when we have this, you know, it's very significant bootstrapping, right? We we draw on lots of kind of sources of information when we kind of try and do our best to make judgments from a kind of medical science viewpoint. That's not unlike other sciences, you know. Yeah, there may be some room for kind of values coming in, but it doesn't immediately mean that it is, you know, it is some like massive normative adjustment. Like all, often these values can be quite. Something that's going right, and you know, baby cases something going right, backed up by all sorts of things, right? Evolutionary biology, 
that we know about people. And so that quite a few of these kind of norms of judgments, some of them basically become part of medical science in a kind of legitimate way. Like that, you know, might somebody kind of try and say, well, that, that we, we can still tell a kind of a, a story like that, even whilst granting your overall thing that you're pressing, is that we, we have to make some of these judgments here. Okay, so I think there's a, a range of thoughts kind of in there so um so one thought is that people might say well of course good clinicians already regard take into account someone's social setting and environment and you know like you have a biopsychosocial approach to thinking about these things and um that i've kind of been attacking a straw man and that, you know good clinicians kind of consider all these social effects in any way and um <coughs> i think i think that's kind of true but I think insofar as they're taking into account of the environmental and social stuff, then they're, they're not using um, uh, kind of particular expertise links of like the biological and psychological sciences. So I guess um, it hasn't come out very much in this talk, but the kind of view of disorder that overall I'm opposed to is a view like Bors's. And so Bors does think of disorder as being a, a matter of biological facts. And you think of humans as being like other organisms, uh, and the organism is you know, designed to achieve various goals. I think that humans are deeply unlike other animals, because partly because I think we do use all this kind of scaffolding type stuff. Um, uh, now, you could investigate this scaffolding type stuff empirically. You know, so I, so I think that when people exercise self-control, they can do things like physically remove themselves from temptation um, or ask their friends to stop and that kind of stuff. Now, that, like, that's not kind of magic. It's things that you could investigate. But I think that it might be hard to get, how should I put this? I think it might be hard, be hard to get kind of law-based generalizations because I think that the, the way, the types of scaffolding that people use, it can vary a lot from case to case. So the... Uh, although you could you know, do kind of physiological research on like, what hearts are like, I don't think you can investigate and externalise externalized practices of self-control in the same sort of way uh, because of the amount of diversity <coughs> that you're going to have in how people actually do it. Um, does that answer your question? Uh not what fully, but I think that's also because I asked my question badly. But I also think there's quite a few questions to build up. And, and what you said was very uh, interesting and probably a very beautiful thought. So I, I'm just going to go back to the question in the chat because quite a few builds have been built up. Like people, that's the something in the, in the room. Uh, so uh, we have Francis Scott. Elizabeth and Mira ask society and culture may also, oh yeah. Society and culture also may be seen as affecting or disrupting our desires and what we're capable of desiring at all. C.E.G. Cinderella's desires, the limited marriage royalties, etc. So I do love that example. <laughs> but more seriously, Western women in 1600 couldn't have most of the desires that you know uh, you and I, uh, as women, have. What do you think of this? Would you say that what counts as a genuine desire that's a disordered desire is culture bound, or would you rather say that there are fundamental desires to people or question? Okay, well, thank you. So that's an interesting kind of question. I think um, I, I think that you know all of us clearly have our beliefs and desires shaped by the culture that we live in. Um, and uh, although that may in various cases be suboptimal, I think it's so common, you know, it's, that's just kind of like the way humans, humans are. Um, and so I think that we don't even want to pick out particularly unusual cases as being cases of distortion. So things, but not just disorders, also, um, you know, like if, if someone hypnotizes you, um, or, or tricks you, you know, in some peculiar way to believe in a load of rubbish, uh, but in an unusual kind of way. Um, 
One of the things that I think is significant is that there are cases where, from the agent's own point of view, things kind of go odd. Um, and somebody finds themselves with mental states that don't fit into their overall values or where it's a radical change from how they were previously. And although I think there can become a normative transformational changes, um, uh, th th those cases uh, stick out as being kind of particularly troubling and potentially suspicious. Whereas the cases where people grow up in a culture with, you know, funny, funny ideas about fashion or whatever, um, those will uh, typically fit in with individuals' mental states. Um, so, uh, so I, I, I see the point that we we all plausibly end up with suboptimal mental states because of the cultures we grow in up in. I don't want to say those are cases of distortion because I think that they're too universal. Thank you. It's a question from Nick W. You uh, said, I'm sorry, Nick, I did miss that earlier, I think. In the history of medicine, when did the term disorder first appear and why was it used or invented to both say a term like disease? Is this historical viewpoint helpful for understanding its meaning today? Um, so I don't really know the answer to that. Um, I think that, so basically, uh, the, the debate I'm engaged in is, is linked to an ongoing debate in the philosophy of medicine. Um, in the philosophy of medicine, people uh, will, will sometimes use the term disorder uh, because they're trying to kind of capture kind of diseases, injuries, wounds all linked together. Um, and, and it's a term that's been particularly popularized, I think, by the work of uh, Jerome Wakefield, who has a, as an account where he uses disorder as a kind of umbrella term for any kind of pathological condition. Um, so it's so it's not just me. <laughs> uh, it's something that, that people in the philosophy of medicine have been doing for a while. To a certain extent, it's a term of art in that I think so. One of the tricky things is, is that I think if you look at our social practices, I think we do have a concept kind of any, of any kind of pathological condition where we do consider diseases, injuries, wounds together. So like there, you can get a sick note for any of them. If you think for any of them, you know, like you, you deserve some treatment and they can excuse what I'm doing and the rest of it. So I think our social practices suggest that we do have uh, some kind of umbrella concept here, but that there's no in common English language word which quite meshes up with it. Um, and so one reason why people uh, in philosophy of medicine sometimes use disorder rather than disease is that disease can, can in certain contexts have the implication that there's a kind of known pathological process, um, uh, uh, whereas disorder is supposed to leave that a bit more ambiguous. Uh, so I think it's a, it, so it's a, I think it's a kind of term of art used in the philosophy of medicine, not just by me. I don't think it has a very deep history. Uh, I think it roughly does correspond to a concept that I think we employ in, in everyday life, but that you can see in the way that we treat people, even though we don't have a common English language word that quite corresponds to it. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, I have this sense, but I don't know what that's based on, that the term mental disorder, I mean, the, the disorder gets used in the mental realm more than the physical realm, but also the main perceived Wakefield's kind of vice producer, that I know, I mean, why? I mean, you, well, we will be interested to discover, you can just Google, you know, you can ask Google how often this term appears in writing and kind of, you know, I don't know how to do that. I think you're right. So disorder is gets used in, in mental health more than more. So I think in mental health, there was a feeling that talk of mental disease and mental illness was somehow more stigmatizing than talk of mental disorder. Um, and, and then, but then also, uh, there, there are traditions where people will only talk of diseases if there's an, a well understood, uh, you know, underlying pathology. Um, there's a question, but I don't know how to pronounce this. I don't even want to guess. A. Rodriguez, uh, who writes throughout the talk, I can see the idea expressed on Professor Cooper's 2020 paper that the term disorder is solidly evaluated. My question is about the role of the environment in the evaluation of mental disorders and whether different spa spheres should, whether different spheres could be included in that environment from physical barriers to socially constructed constraints. How much of what is interpreted as disorders could be understood as a misfit in that relational interaction? 
uh, yeah, thank you. So yeah, that's something something else I'm interested in kind of separately, uh, though it does link in with this as well. So um, I, in cases where people ha you know, have problems doing the things that they want to do, um, there are certain cases where we think it, that the person's uh, got a disorder. There might be other cases where we think that the environment is wrong. You know, the, 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 some, the, the environment's inhospitable or something that's adjusting the environment. And then I think there are also mismatch type cases. So if you think of um, like left-handed people who might struggle with uh, tools designed for right-handed people, that, that's an example that I think we'd think of as a mismatch case. We think, you know, like, there's nothing wrong with them or the scissors, but they need left-handed scissors. Um, uh, and, and then there are cases where there's ongoing arguments. So uh, advocates in the social model of disability will argue that there are various conditions that have traditionally been thought of as individual pathology, where instead we ought to think of it either as a mismatch or a problem in the environment. Um, so then the question is, well, how far can we go? So, so um, basically, I guess my whole line of argument is that in a variety of ways, where we draw the line of disorder depends on kind of ethical and physical judgments. This is one area where I think ethical and physical judgments come in. So roughly, I think we we draw a line as to whether we think it's going to be best to deal with a problem by trying to change the individual or by changing the environment and partly that has to do with questions as to what's practically possible but it also has to do with uh, what kind of environments we think are, are desirable um uh, so, so you, you have talk of kind of reasonable adjustment um and uh, there, I think part of that has to do with the thought that certain environmental changes are both practically possible, but also something that we kind of morally ought to do, um, whereas others uh, might not be. Nice one. I'm just curious about your thoughts about um, the space between thoughts and beliefs and actions, because on one hand, it's tempting to think that. Um, it's the actions that kind of determine whether we think something's a problem or not. So, for example, the, what you're saying about the daisy um, being like a good belief, but if someone was like extreme OCD about it and acting in that way, that could be a problem. But at the same time, like someone who is has like extreme delusional beliefs that are quite inconsequential, um, or someone who's like very high functioning, but they're like deeply miserable sort of thing like it, it seems to not really grasp that we think that's kind of a problem as mm -hmm. well so I'm just curious about the thoughts yeah about. you're right and i've kind of missed that out entirely <laughs> so i think you're right so i think that um uh whether something whether we ought to think of something as a disorder or not whether it's a problem or not has hasn't just got to do with like how someone acts at the end of the day so i think that you there might be disorders that um, cause someone problems with someone's mental states, even though they're able to kind of control that and never act in a particular way. So, for example, suppose something happens to me and I feel these aggressive urges to beat up my kids. Right? Now, I might never act on that, but I still might find it deeply troubling. Um, and I think it might be fair enough to you know, think of that as, as uh, 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 mental states that have been affected by disorder. Um, even though it doesn't affect what I actually do, um, but you know, because of the problems that it causes me, because I don't like it. Being real, this yeah, I mean that also brings me to sort of your. I remember you gave a talk twenty eighteen, so we workshop about the harm criterion. Yeah, um, and I'm like wondering whether what's distinguishing it is is like whether either the individual and or like ex external parties think there's something harmful going on here in the sort of perversion and then obviously that's not going to be a value-free judgment either that there's like something added here because you can say that like i might not act out these 
urges, but I find them deeply disturbing and harmful, right? And that's what really makes it something that I want to see helpful. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, that's, yeah, that's what, what I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, I was thinking of that, like, harm is, is maybe also doing a good job in humiliating disorder. Uh, yes, I think so. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, there's lots of people you disagree with that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, yes. So, um, uh, so yeah, you you, I, you can have views that say that straightforwardly something can only count as a disorder if it's harmful. Um, now. Uh, one difficulty with those kind of views is that some people just disagree <laughs> and and it looks like there are some types of case where people talk of disorders so there doesn't really look to be harm so um uh, like people get diagnosed with tick disorders for example even though in some cases people might not be bothered by them at all you know people might not even notice it um uh, so i guess what i'm trying to do in my work now is to argue that even if people disagree that disorders have to be straightforwardly harmful that there's going to be kind of lo be lots of kind of backdoor kind of issues that do depend on ethical and political judgments to do with whether we think that the issues in the environment of the individual to do with drawing a distinction between um, voluntary action and and action that's indicative of disorder um there's uh Two more questions from the audience, and then I think we should wrap up. One as well as some people thanking you again for your answers as well as your thoughts. So, do you think there's a genuine difference between this is Diane, Diane O'Leary? Do you think there's a genuine difference between mental disorders and purely biological diseases? And if there is, does that difference hinge the choice in some way? Um, um, I don't think there's any clear cut distinction between. Um, mental disorders and physical disorders. Uh, so um, there's lots of in-betweeny kind of cases. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of uh, what you think of as somatic disorders that affect people's mental states and can be made worse by stress and so on. Um, uh, so no, <laughs> I, I, I don't think there is, I don't think there's any clear cut difference. That being said, I do accept that there are some disorders that have greater effects on, you know, things that we normally think of as being more psychological than, than others. Um, so there's going to be some that are kind of more affecting people physically, some that affect people more mentally, but I think there's a whole load in, in the middle, so I wouldn't want to say there was any clear-cut distinction. And then uh, read along with this question because I, I, I haven't quite crossed it one myself in my mind. So this is Pep Romero who asks, thank you for the interesting talk. I'm reading a book right now that reaches into the history of mental illness and diagnosis called Mind Fixes. And from what I've read so far, the style for these quote, quote, disorders are seen with more sympathy is when it's taken as a medicalized point of view. The changes are seen as outside of someone's capacity to change on their own, addiction as an illness, changes in the brain and mental illness. People are given more tools in order to improve. What are your thoughts on this? So the thought there is that thinking of things in medical terms is generally kind of progressive um, because it enables people to access therapies that, that help them. Um, uh, I think that's sometimes true, but not always. Uh, and I guess the other thing I think is that in some cases, what someone receives as kind of medical treatment might well help them, but might well help other people as well. So I think that most people uh, struggle to lead their lives as well as they could, and that various forms of kind of counselling or psychotherapy might help fairly much anyone, you know, to kind of uh, um, and uh, that the, the also various kinds of psychoactive medication might um, help lots of people to kind of be happier. Um, 
so so I mean, like in some ways the comment seems to be a kind of like you know proof is in the pudding kind of look it works out well for people when they're considered to have a mental disorder um i think that sometimes things do work out well for people but that the same practices might help other people as well and also i think there are negative effects on people uh, when they come to be thought of as having a mental disorder particularly in cases where maybe therapies aren't that effective so um uh when people think of themselves as having a disorder, it affects how other people think of them, but also how people think of themselves. Um, uh, uh, in ways that aren't always aren't always useful. Fantastic. I think with that, we kind of reached uh, the end of our time. So um, I want to uh, thank. Average people for wonderful talk. If people want to unmute and join us in a round of applause.